Hello everyone. This is SK Mehta, presently the president of the Indian Nuclear Society called INS. I wish to welcome you all to this INS series lectures. This series about uh, 13 lectures is aimed to acquaint you with the various aspects of the nuclear energy, its utilization in various areas benefiting humanity, the limitations and the regulatory aspects in safety and protection. One of the main objectives of the INS is to promote the advancement of nuclear science and engineering and technology related to the atomic nucleus and the allied sciences and arts. With this objective, INS has been disseminating information through journals, books, reports, newsletters, seminars, and conferences. These have mainly been to keep the INS members and other scientific communities and organizations well informed about the development in the various areas of science and technology within India and world over. All it relies that there is a need to keep the various professionals, undergraduate students, and general public knowledgeable in their respective fields of a nuclear science and engineering. For the benefit of, uh, of the public, some of the important and the common application of nuclear being for power, industrial use, medical diagnosis and treatment, agriculture, food preservation, and various other areas. This lecture series is made in simple language and illustration with the aim to inform the general viewer about the science, engineering, and technology, social benefits of the nuclear, application of nuclear carrier benefits in nuclear and regulatory and safety of the nuclear energy. The presentations are prepared and narrated by experts on each topic in a way that the viewers with no background knowledge about the nuclear science and engineering can understand. Our effort will be to constantly provide information about newer benefits to the society emerging out of the pain-taking research and nuclear science and engineers. Viewers are encouraged to comment, suggest, and put forward questions to the experts. The channel of the constructive communication will always be open in INS, which is website ins-india.org. Welcome all to this wonderful lecture series by Indian Nuclear Society. There are 13 lectures on various topics related to nuclear energy and its application to societal benefits. All these lectures will cover different aspects of nuclear energy in sectors like power, medicine, agriculture, and society. It illustrates in simple way the science behind nuclear reactors for all of us. Welcome to this lecture on concepts of heat and mass transfer in nuclear reactors. I am Umkar Gokhale from the Reactor Safety Division of Bhabha Atomic Research Center. We all are aware that nuclear power plants are used for production of electricity. The safety of these nuclear power plants is very important and is given the highest priority in all the activities of nuclear power plant, such as selection of the site, design of the reactor, construction and operation. Safety in design is ensured with the help of appropriate application of scientific phenomena. Today in this lecture, we will try to understand how a nuclear power plant generates electricity how various steps of energy conversion take place. Various aspects of heat as a form of energy 
different modes of heat transfer with examples and associated mass transfer as well. A typical power plant contains a boiler that uses an energy source such as coal or oil or natural gas and the energy obtained is used to convert water into steam. This steam then flows into a turbine which is connected to a generator that generates electricity. The steam coming out of the turbine is converted into water again and sent back to the boiler. When it comes to a nuclear power plant, most of the components of the power plant such as the turbine, the condenser, the generator remain similar to an ordinary power plant. However, the source of energy, the boiler using fossil fuels is replaced with a nuclear reactor that uses the energy obtained from nuclear fusion reaction of uranium to generate steam. This figure shows some of the systems of a nuclear power plant. The energy generated from the fusion reaction in the reactor is ultimately converted into electricity in the generator. This involves several steps of conversion of energy and its transfer as well. Let us try to see in more details various components involved in these steps. A typical flow diagram of a pressurized heavy water reactor looks like this. It has several components such as the calendria vessel which houses several horizontal pipes called as the channels. The fuel is kept within the channels in the form of fuel bundles and this acts as a source of energy. The energy is transferred to coolant that flows into these channels and is taken away to the steam generators. The flow of coolant is established using pumps. The component sitting at the top of this figure is the steam generator. The steam generator is a very complex component that performs the task of converting the energy obtained from the coolant flow into generation of steam from water. It has a very complex geometrical structure involving intricate components housed in a mushroom shape shell. Although it looks very small in the figure, its magnanimity can be realized by looking at this picture. It shows a steam generator of 540 megawatt PHWR being installed in place and it appears as a gigantic component in front of the engineers which are doing the installation task. The steam generator accepts the coolant flow received from the channels. The energy of the coolant is taken away and used for steam generation. In this process, the coolant loses its energy in the steam generator, whereas the feed water gains this energy and is converted to steam that flows out to the turbine. So the energy derived from coal or natural gas in a power plant or from the nuclear fuel in a nuclear power plant is ultimately converted to electricity that we use. How does this conversion of energy take place? Is there a common form of energy which exhibits in all power plants before electricity is generated? Yes, this energy form is known as heat energy. We human beings are well aware of, of such forms of energy. We have been using it indirectly, for example, to shelter ourselves from cold winter nights or hot sunny days. Let us now understand a little more about what is this heat energy and how it is produced and how it can be transferred. The heat energy stored in objects is represented by the temperature. The energy is possessed due to the movement of atoms and molecules that constitute the matter. For solids, we all know that atoms and molecules are arranged in certain patterns. These particles tend to oscillate or vibrate about their mean position due to the temperature of the matter. Similarly, in fluids such as liquids or gases, the random motion of fluid particles is the representative of temperature and hence the heat energy that the fluid contains. The magnitude of these movements about the mean position in solids or the random movements in the fluids are proportional to the magnitude of heat energy available. 
the heat content of an object is evident in the form of energy transfer from high temperature to low temperature the heat content cannot be sensed in isolation it can be sensed only in the form of interaction of that object and this interaction definitely involves transfer of a heat energy from or to the object depending on its temperature for example hotness of a cup of coffee is not evident just by looking at it as evident as potential energy of the pendulum in the farthest position in the oscillation the kinetic energy possessed by the pendulum at its mean position can be visualized due to its velocity it has but the coldness of an ice cube can be realized only after touching it which involves interaction all these interactions involve transfer of heat energy from high temperature to low temperature in one of the modes of heat transfer that is conduction convection or radiation let us now understand how heat is generated fossil fuels is one of the widely used form of energy source we use fossil fuels in the form of petrol diesel coal and natural gas these fuels contain the energy in the form of chemical energy and this energy is liberated in the form of heat during the process of combustion which is essentially chemical recombination of carbon atoms contained by the fuel with the oxygen atoms for example a kg of butane gas which we all use as cooking gas liberates about 49.5 megajoules of energy during combustion in case of nuclear fusion which takes place in a nuclear reactor the uranium 235 atoms interact with neutrons of specific energy and these atoms split into two or more atoms and release energy about a kg of uranium 235 generates 82 terajoules of energy compare this with the burning of lpg and it is about 2 million times higher another practically inexhaustible source of energy is the sun the sun uses fusion of hydrogen atoms into helium atoms and the difference in the masses is liberated as heat energy the amount of energy generated per unit mass of hydrogen is even higher than the nuclear fusion reaction of uranium 235 by a factor of about 100 so in comparison to the fossil fuels the energy generated per unit mass of fuel is extremely high for the nuclear fusion and fusion source of heat in addition burning of fossil fuels causes release of carbon dioxide which produces the greenhouse effect leading to overall rise in the temperature of atmosphere there are pollution concerns associated with this as well on the other hand nuclear fusion and fusion neither release carbon dioxide nor cause environmental pollution let us now understand how the transfer of heat energy takes place the conduction mode of heat transfer involves heat transfer due to exchange of energy between particles of higher temperature with the particles of lower temperature we have already seen that the particles of medium atoms and molecules possess vibrational motion which is proportional to the temperature in case of solids the atoms and molecules at high temperature exhibit higher magnitude of such vibrational motion these particles transfer their energy due to interaction with the neighboring set of atoms or molecules and due to this interaction the energy of these neighboring set of molecules increases and they now vibrate with higher magnitude than earlier these molecules now tend to impart this energy to the next set of neighboring particles and so on in this process the energy is passed in the direction of decreasing temperature hence there is a net transfer of energy the heat energy in the direction of decreasing temperature certain special solids such as metals contain large amount of free electrons all of us know that these electrons enable flow of electricity in the metals these very set of electrons also tend to pass on heat energy due to their random movements hence metals have an added advantage in conducting heat energy which makes them good conductor of heat in case of fluids the conduction heat transfer takes place due to collision between continuously moving atoms or molecules the movement of these particles is random there is no bulk or microscopic movement of liquid or gas for example the air contained in a closed container is stationary in its overall existence however the air molecules continue to move in random fashion within the container if one of the walls of container is at higher temperature than the others 
then the molecules that interact with this wall pick up heat energy the heat energy is transferred to all other molecules that interact with these high heat energy atoms and molecules and so on there is no macroscopic movement of air molecules yet there is transfer of heat from the high temperature wall to the low temperature wall through conduction the conduction mode of heat transfer is governed by the fourier's law of conduction the fourier's law of conduction can be expressed mathematically as q is equal to minus k a dt by dx where q is the heat transfer rate measured in watts k is the thermal conductivity of the medium which has units of watts per meter kelvin a is the area normal to the direction of heat transfer and dt by dx is the temperature gradient in the direction of heat flow it is important to note a negative sign which indicates that the heat transfer is positive in the direction of negative temperature gradient that is in the direction of decreasing temperature in other other words the heat flows from higher temperature to the lower temperature region since conduction mode of heat transfer depends on the vibrational motion of particles that constitute the medium this mode of heat transfer is controlled by the thermophysical property of the medium which is known as thermal conductivity thermal conductivity depends on the type of material for example metallic medium will generally have higher thermal conductivity than non metallic medium due to presence of free electrons it is also a function of the temperature of the medium one important point to note here is that a medium is absolutely necessary for conduction to take place there can be no conduction if there is no medium we will now discuss few examples that make use of conduction heat transfer in day to day life the first one is a frying pan that we use every day the pan is made up of a metallic flat plate with a wooden handle when kept on the burner flame the metallic pan transfers the heat quickly from the flame to the object being cooked due to its high thermal conductivity the use of metal for making pan also helps in achieving uniform temperature on the entire surface of the pan an earthen pot on the other hand has a lower thermal conductivity and hence it needs to be kept on a well spread flame therefore an earthen pot kept on a well spread flame is equivalent to a metal pan on a small burner and can achieve similar effects the handle is made out of wood which has a low thermal conductivity this helps in shielding our hands from the hot temperature pan the wooden handle restricts the heat that can flow from hot the hot pan to the human body this does not mean that there is no conduction in the handle the handle is a material medium containing particles and there exists a temperature difference between the hot pan and our hand but due to its lower thermal conductivity the rate of heat transfer is so small that our hands can tolerate an industrial example of conduction is steam carrying pipes from a boiler the steam is taken out from the boiler to a location of its use through long pipes to limit the losses of heat from the pipe the pipe is insulated with a lower thermal conductivity material such as glass wool the second mode of heat transfer is called convection this mode is applicable only to fluids liquids and gases in convection the heat transfer takes place due to macroscopic motion of fluid particles in addition to the heat transfer by conduction the example here shows water being heated in a vessel near the surface of the vessel the liquid is practically stationary and hence heat is transferred by conduction however in the bulk of the fluid the heated water moves up and is replaced by cold water moving downwards the convection currents are the setup in water due to density difference such microscopic movement can be induced due to external forces also such as pumps and blowers the former is the case of natural convection and the latter is called the forced convection the convection is controlled by the fluid thermophysical properties such as the thermal conductivity density specific heat capacity and viscosity more importantly the convection phenomena is governed by the type of flow the flow parameters can be engineered suitably to achieve better convection heat transfer heat transfer by convection is mathematically expressed as 
Q equal to H A into T surface minus T fluid, where Q is the heat transfer rate measured in watts, H is the heat transfer coefficient measured in watts per meter square Kelvin and is typically determined from experimental observations and is made available in the form of correlations. T surface is the surface temperature, T fluid is the bulk fluid temperature and A is the area of contact between the surface and the fluid. Consider an object kept in free air. If the surface temperature of the object is more than the surrounding air, it will tend to lose heat. And this is the case of natural convection. If the object is kept in front of the blower, then the temperature drop will be faster due to forced convection. Industrial heat exchangers are used for transferring of heat carried by the process fluid to a coolant using convection mode of heat transfer. The process fluid and the coolant are arranged on two sides of the heat exchanger tubes such that there is only heat transfer between the fluids and these fluids do not mix with each other. The figure shows the steam as the process fluid is entering through steam inlet, loses its heat and gets condensed and leaves in the form of condensate. The water used as the coolant medium enters through the water inlet, flows through the tubes, picks up the heat and leaves through the water outlet. In order to have efficient heat transfer in the heat exchangers, the convective heat transfer on the process fluid side as well as the coolant side needs to be effective. In the industrial heat exchangers, the convective heat transfer enhancement is done by using turbulent flow for the fluid flowing through the tubes and by using cross flow direction for the fluids flowing over the tube. In case of laminar flow, the fluid moves in the form of laminar layers with limited mixing between the layers. Whereas for turbulent flow, the fluid particle movement is chaotic, achieving better mixing of the fluid. It is known that the convective heat transfer is better in turbulent flow than the laminar flow. This way, a more effective heat transfer from the hot fluid to the coolant can be achieved, keeping the same flow A rate requirement. Another method of heat transfer enhancement is by using surface attachments or flow inserts. One such flow insert is shown in the figure and is inserted into a tubular flow. The aim of the flow insert is to increase turbulence in the fluid, thereby increasing the mixing of the fluid in the localized region. Such inserts can also be used to convert laminar flows into turbulent flows for a given fluid flow rate. Of course, use of such inserts in the flow paths leads to increase in pumping power requirement, but it helps in achieving better convective heat transfer. Similar effects can be obtained with the help of a ceiling fan, which keeps us cool in hot summer by increasing the H, the heat transfer coefficient. Heat transfer enhancement can also be achieved by increasing the area available for the heat transfer. The standard motorbike engines we see every day contain metallic fins attached over the engine body. The fins are made out of a metal which is a good conductor of heat. The heat generated in the engine body is effectively conducted through the metallic fins. The geometry of the fins and its orientation is so selected that more area is available for the convection heat transfer from the fin surface to the ambient air. The increasing area availability leads to enhancement in the heat transfer capability through convection heat transfer mode. Some specialized applications of convective heat transfer make use of the phenomena of phase change for heat transfer enhancement. Phase change is a process of transformation of the medium from one phase to another and in doing so requires heat inputs or are associated with heat release. For example, ice cubes floating in glass of water melt. The phase changes from solid to liquid. The heat required in this transformation is absorbed from the water in the glass. Thus, the water in the glass cools down. Similarly, when water boils and gets converted to steam, the heat energy required for the transformation must be supplied by the source of heat. The requirement of heat energy in the phase change process is substantially higher than the energy requirement in simple heat up process. About 280 kilojoules of energy is required to increase the temperature of 1 kg of water from 30 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius. But consider the same amount of water being converted into steam. The energy required is the distance between these blue curves at a given pressure. 
and this is substantially higher than the energy requirement for heat up in other words the capability of coolant to carry heat energy is substantially higher when the fluid is undergoing phase change associated with such phase change process is the formation of bubbles detachment of bubbles from the heater surface and several such microscopic phenomena in the natural convection case the heated fluid near the surface becomes lighter and moves up and the heavier fluid comes down this leads to formation of natural convection currents leading to increase in h whenever a bubble of steam is formed over a heater surface it has to fight for its own space against the neighboring water molecules with the energy received from the surface this bubble is able to establish its own space in the pool of water molecules and also able to grow in size by displacing nearby water molecules away this increases turbulence in the local domain thereby increasing the heat transfer coefficient h once the bubble becomes big enough it detaches from the surface and moves upwards by buoyant force the space of this originally attached bubble is filled up by surrounding water molecules again enabling formation of second bubble at the same site this causes an increase in effective area a available for heat transfer the bubbles that move upward can get merged thereby increasing turbulence and effective h again the net effect of all such phenomena is significant increase in the convective heat transfer The figure here shows the famous Nokia pool boiling curve. It is generated by dipping an electrically heated wire in a pool of stationary water, and it depicts the increase in heater surface temperature over the boiling water temperature on x-axis, and the capacity of heat flux removal by water on y-axis. What is interesting here is to note that when boiling is taking place, that is, heater surface temperature is more than the boiling temperature. for a small change in heater surface temperature the heat flux removal capacity increases by orders of magnitude in the natural convection and nucleate boiling region if we compare the heat removal capacity values with a non boiling no phase change case where surface temperature is lower than 100 degrees celsius the heat flux is significantly lower than the boiling case so it signifies that by introducing phase change the capability of convective heat transfer increases several folds if we have a flowing system the heat removal capability increases further the lower curve here shows the pool boiling curve for stationary water as we discussed in previous slide and the curve at the top shows the heat removal capability in a flowing system it can be seen that there is significant increase in the heat transfer capability over pool boiling due to the flow of the fluid one more method of achieving increase in convective heat transfer is by associating it with mass transfer we will now try to understand the process of mass transfer the modes of mass transfer have striking similarity with conduction and convection modes of heat transfer the diffusion of mass transfer takes place due to gradient in concentration of one medium into another medium without any bulk movement of fluid molecules of the second medium this is very similar to the conduction mode of heat transfer and it depends on the properties of medium that is diffusing as well as the medium in which diffusion is taking place a classic example of this is a perfume bottle in a room with no air circulation the opening of perfume bottle can be felt almost as soon as it is opened the molecules of perfume the medium that is diffusing in the air have high concentration near the bottle the concentration is negligible elsewhere in the room before opening of the bottle this concentration gradient drives the diffusion of perfume molecules through the air medium a similar phenomena can be seen by injecting slight amount of ink into a bucket full of water we can notice that the diffusion of ink in the bucket is much slower than the diffusion of perfume in air this indicates that diffusion is affected by the individual choice of media as well as their combination the convective mass transfer involves mass transfer due to bulk movement of fluid in contact with the surface similar to the convective mode of heat transfer 
it is controlled by the mass diffusion coefficient for the combination of media properties and the fluid flow parameters an example of convective mass transfer is a wet cloth being dried by holding it in front of an air blower we know that by increasing the velocity of blown air or its temperature the cloth dries faster in much of the cases of convective mass transfer including this example of drying of cloth a convective heat transfer is inherently present we shall discuss this with an example of use of earthen pots as water coolers the example of use of earthen pots as water coolers involves both convective heat as well as mass transfer we all know that the air surrounding us contains some amount of water in the form of humidity the earthen pots contain large amount of small pores which allow inside water to seep through these pores to the surface the layer of air just next to the pot surface picks up this water by the way of phase change the humidity or the water concentration in this layer is thus higher than anywhere else in the room this gradient of concentration in combination with flow of air drives transfer of these water molecules in the form of humidity from the higher concentration region to the lower concentration region the phase change process that takes place at the pot surface requires heat energy which is taken from the pot surface and the water within the pot producing a cooling effect an increase in flow of air enhances the cooling process of water hence one might have seen truck drivers hanging their water bottles in jute bags outside the truck the cooling process is also affected by the humidity already present in air hence such pot coolers are found to be more effective in dry areas in comparison to humid areas so we have seen how the conduction and convection modes of heat transfer and associated modes of mass transfer are used in simple daily life examples now let us try to understand how the radiation mode of heat transfer works examples of radiation heat transfer include the energy received from the sun which travels through space through a distance of about 1500 lakh kilometers containing no medium for heat transfer radiation mode of heat transfer is effectively used in solar cookers as well the radiation heat energy being received from the sun is concentrated on the cooker container a specific selection of surface texture increases the radiation absorption capacity of the cooler container thereby assisting in cooking process the radiation mode of heat transfer is little different from the other two modes of heat transfer it does not require any medium for the heat transfer to take place the heat in the form of electromagnetic waves is emitted by all atoms and molecules that constitute matter at all the times in fact the thermal radiation forms a small portion of the entire electromagnetic wave spectrum the visible light is also a small subset of this electromagnetic spectrum that is why some flames can be seen and some others cannot the amount of radiation that a surface emits depends on the temperature of the surface and its surface properties all the surfaces also have a capacity to absorb all or a part of radiation that falls on it similar to other electromagnetic radiations and unlike conduction and convection mode of heat transfer the radiation mode of heat transfer does not require any medium for heat transfer and hence the radiation heat transfer is independent of the medium properties unlike the conduction or convective heat transfer the energy transfer by radiation mode is mathematically expressed by the stefan's boltzmann's law of radiation it states that the heat transfer rate is proportional to the surface area emissivity of the surface and fourth power of the temperature and the constant of proportionality is called the stefan's boltzmann constant the emissivity is a surface characteristic value now that we have discussed different concepts of heat and mass transfer let us try to understand how these concepts are applied to nuclear reactors the safety of the nuclear reactors is governed by three safety functions which are popularly known as three c's of safety and these are 
control cool and confine in the control function the objective is to control nuclear reaction taking place in the nuclear reactors this is achieved by systems that comprise of shutoff rods and control rods the second safety function is to cool the nuclear fuel for this purpose we have a dedicated heat transport system along with several other safety systems these systems ensure that the heat generated in the nuclear fuel is safely taken out to the steam generators and used effectively for generation of electricity ultimately the third safety function is to confine the nuclear radiation and it is achieved by systems such as the containment system we will now focus on the second safety function of cooling and try to understand how concepts of heat and mass transfer are used in achieving this particular safety function the figure here shows the primary heat transport system of a pressurized heavy water reactor this system consists of several horizontal channels which are housed in calandria nuclear fuel in the form of bundles is arranged within these channels and acts as a source of heat this heat is removed by continuous flow of coolant through these channels so the coolant enters the channels at a lower temperature picks up the heat as it flows over the bundles it gets heated and exits from the other end of the channel the fuel used in nuclear reactors is in the form of cylindrical pellets of uranium the heat is generated within this fuel pellets due to uranium fission reaction that we have seen earlier this heat is transferred outwards towards the surface of these pellets by conduction mode of heat transfer the fuel pellets are contained inside a clad tube which is made out of metallic zircaloy the spaces between the pellets and the clad tube is filled with helium this is because helium has higher thermal conductivity than many of other gases the space between fuel pellet and this tube is not sufficient for establishing any convection currents hence the primary mode of heat transfer through the helium gas is also by conduction the clad tube being made out of metallic zircaloy helps in transferring the heat to the outer surface of the clad tube through conduction mode of heat transfer the fuel pins are then arranged in a geometry which is specific to the nuclear reactors for example for the pressurized heavy water reactors the fuel pins are arranged in bundle geometry which may consist of 19 or 37 pins as shown in the figure whereas for the boiling water reactors the fuel pins are arranged in square pitch fashion and are arranged vertically as shown in the figure on the right hand side in case of phwr the bundles are arranged horizontally inside the pressure tube there are bearing pads and split spacers which maintain the fuel bundle distance from the pressure tube surface as well as the distance between the individual fuel pins the flow rates are so selected so that the flow is in the turbulent flow regime which leads to better heat transfer as compared to laminar regime the flow rate is maintained with the help of a pump hence it's a forced convection heat transfer which provides a better heat transfer and the bundle geometry allows flow of coolant over all fuel pins providing maximum heat transfer area and facilitates easy removal of heat generated within the fuel pins by convective mode of heat transfer some of the finer aspects of convective mode of heat transfer are effectively used in achieving and maintaining better heat transfer over the fuel pits one such aspect is the range of coolant temperature selected with respect to the boiling temperature of the coolant the coolant is always maintained substantially below the coolant boiling temperature this means that the heat flux on the fuel surface is removed by convective heat transfer without any phase change in the coolant if you look at the pool boiling curve the maximum heat removal capability is substantially higher in case of boiling than the convective heat transfer capability without boiling so this ensures that only a part of heat transfer removal capability of the coolant is utilized keeping large amount of safety margin another important parameter to note is the heat flux on the fuel pin surface 
the heat flux is maximum at the center along the length of the PHWR channel. However, its value is significantly lower than the maximum heat flux removal capability of the coolant. The figure shows that the heat flux removal limit observed in force convection is substantially higher than the pool boiling curve. Thus, by use of appropriate geometry of the fuel bundle, selection of flow parameters such as the flow rate, heat flux values, and assured removal of heat from the fuel pin is ensured. Some aspects of natural convection heat transfer are also considered in the reactor design to ensure passive coolability in case of unavailability of the pumps. The fuel bundles inside the pressure tubes are contained in the calendria vessel, which is at a much lower elevation. In comparison, the steam generators where the heat is removed are located at much higher elevation. In case of unavailability of the pumps, the elevation difference between the heat source in the calendria and the heat sink in the steam generator, a natural circulation is established that ensures coolability of the core without pump requirement. The concept of natural convection heat transfer is also used in innovative designs of newer generation reactors. One such design shown in the figure on the left hand side is for the passivity heat removal system in VVR type reactors located at Kudankulam in India. The PHRS heat exchangers shown in amber color are located outside the containment building. These heat exchangers are cooled by natural draft of air and are used to condense the steam from the steam generators in case of unavailability of normal cooling system. The passive DK heat removal system used in 700 megawatt electric PHWRs is also one such example of natural convection heat transfer mode in combination with phase change process. This is shown in the figure on the right hand side. The DK heat is ultimately removed by the PDHR tank water. Use of such passive designs not only adds to the layer of safety but also ensures coolability without any operator intervention making the designs less prone to operator errors. The steam generators in the power plants make use of several concepts of heat transfer enhancement. The flow is maintained in the turbulent re flow regime for better heat transfer. The direction of flow in the tube and the shell side is selected appropriately to achieve most efficient design configuration. And in the shell side, the water is converted into steam, which involves a phase change process. A combination of all these concepts lead to an efficient and robust steam generator design. The natural draft cooling towers used in nuclear power plants make use of concepts of heat and mass transfer. The, these cooling towers consist of a specific parabolic structure. The hot water from the power plants is sprayed in these cooling towers. Formation of small droplets in the spray increases the heat transfer area available for the heat and mass transfer. The ambient air in the tower comes in contact with these small and hot droplets and some amount of heat is transferred to this air due to conduction and convection heat transfer. In addition, a small amount of water evaporates and is taken away by the air. The heat that is required for this evaporation is taken from the remaining water producing a cooling effect for the water. This cooled water is then collected at the bottom and recirculated to the power plant. The air which has now become hotter due to its heat and mass transfer becomes lighter due to change in density. This air tends to move upwards and fresh ambient temperature air is sucked in naturally from the side openings. This way, a natural draft is established which can provide cooling without requirement of any blowers. The effects of humidity and the temperature of the ambient air factor are factored in while designing such cooling towers to ensure steady performance through seasonal ambient variations. To summarize, we have seen heat as a form of energy, various sources of heat energy the modes of heat transfer. We also discussed about modes of mass transfer and their similarity with the heat transfer modes. We discussed in details the applications of heat and mass transfer concepts 
to different components and systems of a nuclear power plant and how the efficient use of these concepts leads to enhanced performance and enhanced safety of nuclear reactors thank you for your attention so i hope you all enjoy this lecture do not miss other lecture from indian nuclear society if you have any questions please write to us on this email id thank you